Ever had a conversation with someone who plays the stock market? I have, and I've rarely heard about anything other than their wins. Do you wonder how and where they learnt what to do, or do you secretly doubt whether they do in fact know as much and do as well as they say they do? Well, today we're going to discuss the pros and cons of do-it-yourself investing and what you'll need to know if you're keen to go down this path and achieve any success. And of course, we'll be including property in the discussion. Focus on companies that you can understand and only those companies that you can understand. Because if you focus on, if you try and think about something that you don't understand, you'll never be able to put a value on it. You'll never be able to say, I think it's worth this much. Welcome to The Elephant in the Room. This is the podcast where we love to talk about the big things in property that never usually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent, co-host of Foxtel's Location, Location, Location Australia and author of Auction Ready. And I'm Chris Bates, mortgage broker. Before we get started, I need to let you know that nothing we say on here can be taken as personal advice. We always recommend you engage the services of a professional. Don't forget that you can access the transcript for this episode on the website as well as Download our free full or forecast report. Which experts can you trust to get it right? The elephant in the room.com.au. Today we're joined by Owen Raskovich, the founder of Rask Australia, a diversified business providing members only investment advice platform, ASX news and publishing, podcasts and education. And while investing in ASX and global shares is their day job, his team's mission is to get 10,000 adult students enrolled into Rask's free online investing tax, valuation and finance courses over the next year. Now, we're keen to understand where the biggest knowledge gaps are and how people who are so inclined can ride the share market or the property market for that matter without being bucked off the horse. Thanks for joining us, Owen. That's wonderful to be on the show. Thanks for inviting me on. G'day, Owen. Good to chat, mate. Um, I guess there's lots we're keen to chat about today, but I think just to start us off, where do the people who are kind of DIYers get it so wrong with with investing? Uh, That's a pretty big question and a great way to start, I guess. Um, In my opinion, it's behaviour. So when we talk about investing, particularly in shares or um, what I like to say are just businesses, when you invest in businesses, one of the the most common mistakes Mm -hmm. that people make are falling trapped to behavioural biases, which I know that you guys have covered at great length throughout the series. We love them. Or we hate them. <laughs> we love to talk about them. <laughs> yes, you love to. We we often like to, I guess, uh, muse about everyone else's failings. But it can be sometimes very difficult to look internally and make that self assessment, which is why I find it so fascinating. I guess because it, there's so many layers to it, and case by case it varies. But I, if I had to pinpoint one thing, it would be probably temperament is the way or the 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 area that people uh, tend to go astray. Um, they they tend to think, you know, too short term is probably the most, uh, if I'm mm. generalizing, the most uh, common, I guess, flaw that I see in, in DIY investing. But there are many others, which I'm sure we'll get to. So you're saying in terms of short termism, it kind of encourages people to look for quick wins rather than sort of accumulating assets over time and looking just to focus on their long-term goals. Mm. That then leads to speculation rather than investing is that kind of the thought process there yeah exactly that's the precise way you could sum it up um i I would say that you know it's not just diy investors i would say much of the world is uh falls into this because you see it uh, with fund managers who are supposed to be the most sophisticated and they have tend to tend to have what we call agency risk so you know charlie munger says tell me where i'm going to die and i won't go there and it's a roundabout way of saying um, follow the incentives. And so if you follow right. the incentives right from the very top with the fund managers who we hold in such esteem, right down to the average punter who might be listening to this um, sitting in their land room with a buy order in their brokerage account, um, the most important thing is to understand the incentives of people. And so often, you know, when we think about incentives, it's like the, I, I guess you could bring it back to biology uh, or even physics, we, we tend to think in terms of, you know, our emotions are anchored in the present, but the future is what we're investing in. So there's kind of this mismatch between expectations and our emotions. And it's a really uh, complex thing to untangle for most people. And particularly uh-huh. when you're, uh, I guess, embracing something or you should be embracing something which is quite overwhelming being money and finance. 
It sort of nails it though, doesn't it? I mean, the thing is that a lot of the reason people want to invest is because they want to get rich or they Mm -hmm. want to be comfortable or they want freedom or whatever. Um, But we're sort of very much thinking about now, what we want now. But the reality is that investing requires time. And so, you know, that sort of gets to the very core of the problem, doesn't it? Mm, Absolutely. And, you know, uh, Chris, you mentioned that it's all about accumulating assets. I think one of the best books I read on this was um, just about the accumulation angle was from Pete Wargent, who's a, a, you guys will know him. Um, We've interviewed him a couple of times. We love Pete. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Pete's a great guy. Um, So Pete talks about in his Get a Financial Grip book, which was his first one, I believe, he talks about how he changed his mindset from, I guess, buying and selling. Like I think some of the most dangerous words in investing are buy low, sell high, because then, Mm. then you have to make two decisions. Why not just make one good one and just say buy? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that comes back to what Pete would say is accumulation of assets. So buying things that make money and will make money for a very long period of time, and I'm sure we'll get to some ideas around that, but um, I think if people just brought it back to that simple phrase of accumulating assets, Robert Kiyosaki talks about this in Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you know, you have your, your different, I guess, cash flow, your, balance, your own personal balance sheet where you have assets and you have liabilities. Just try and build up those assets as, as best you can. And so, yeah, uh, uh, Veronica, I heard you, uh, you talk in, in a previous show about investment property. Maybe 95% of properties are things that people should avoid, but there's 5% that are really high quality. Um, and it's the same in shares, I guess. It's probably even less than 5%, I would say. In terms of actual funds, um you know, I think that's, you know, in terms of accumulating assets, you can accumulate any asset or you can accumulate kind of quality assets. But a lot of people go out and they say, well, I don't want to do the share trading myself because I have no idea what's the best stock. So I'll buy a fund. How do you actually pick a good fund though? Is it all marketing or is there actually a way to determine what's one good fund versus, you know, a fund you should avoid? Mm. I guess that's a, that's a, that's a good Good, very good question. And um, again, there's many ways to answer this. I think if we take the historical context, I think it was the author J.L. Collins from the US who said that um, if you look back over 30 years, there aren't too many fund managers that have survived that entire time. And mind you, I should, I guess, um, say that I interview fund managers in one of our podcast series and yeah. they're fantastic, they're intelligent, there's a lot of smart people in there. Um and so this isn't a war on active fund managers which are, who are fund managers that invest in individual stocks and try and find companies yep. that outperform versus index investing. But J.L. Collins' point was that if you look back over 30 years, pretty much the only fund managers that are still in existence or have done well are index fund managers. So fund managers that are passive and follow the stock market index like the ASX 200. But I guess if you're trying to pick an active fund manager, so someone who you believe has, I guess, whether that, you could call it skill or, or something else, some sort of insight or edge, um, if you're trying to pick someone, you actually have two layers of complexity because you have to actually pick them and you have to pick their style. So oftentimes what happens, and this comes back to my time working for Zenith Investment Partners, which is an Australian yeah. um, research house. It's probably the, the leading research house, I dare say. Um, And oftentimes what we found is that when people pick fund managers, they're often drawn in by the charisma of the fund manager. And what I've found is sometimes the quirkiest, weirdest, uh, most strange people often turn out to be the best investors because I guess they can be aloof, but they can be aloof from emotion. They're not out to sell you anything. So I've actually found throughout my time that the very best investors are in fact DIY investors who are reluctant to take on people's money. So that's kind of a, an interesting one. The people that you want to invest with, chances are they're the people that don't want your money because they want to it. do it themselves. Yeah. <laughs> so. oh, but, uh, because you often hear that it's like the, the people out there on the campaign trail, they're, they're doing the conferences, they're doing the big, you know, selling the, the, the systems, all that sort of stuff. You just keep thinking, you know, if it really was that successful, you know, wouldn't you just be quiet and just do it yourself? Yeah. Of this, oh, I'm on a mission. I've got to share this wonderful key to the for the world. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I, I don't mean to you know bash the fund managers because I, there are some brilliant ones out there, and I invest yeah. in ETFs, and I have some very good friends who are fantastic fund managers, and I'm happily invested with them. Um, but I guess the thing is, if I could come back to a few concrete ideas, um, it would be just again follow the incentives of the fund manager, right? So I. 
if I was investing in a, in a fund manager, my personal preference, and everyone's different, would be to invest in a small cap fund manager. So a fund manager that invests in smaller companies, because I believe that's where they have, um, where, where better insights can mm. be gained and mm. edge, if you like. And so um, I would invest with fund managers that are in that field. But yeah. you know, lo and behold, there are fund managers now in Australia. Um, and I probably, I should refrain from naming names, but I could, um, that don't charge a management fee. So they, if you invest with them, they won't take any of your money day to day out of, out of your investment mm. automatically. They only take money if they outperform. And so if you follow the incentives, right, you can get to the basis of why they do things. And if they're properly benchmarked, like they choose a good benchmark to assess their performance against, they will only collect a fee if they outperform. And then another thing on top of that is that many of those fund managers also have what we call a high watermark, which is in effect them saying that we will not charge you fees even if we do well in the last 12 months or the last five years, if we haven't gone back and above anything that we've lost in the past, we still won't collect a fee. So there, there, are, mm. there are some fund managers, particularly in the US, who, who do not charge management fees, who haven't collected a fee for 10 years because they've had one really bad year and then they've taken 10 years to get back to that. So how and do so, they stay in business? That's, so this is a really interesting run. And the, the, this is, I guess, where it's, it's very important to think about um, who you're investing with. So a lot of these fund managers are independently wealthy. So it comes back to my mm. point about um, them not wanting to necessarily take on as much money as they can. They're more just investing their own money. Um, they might have, let's say, for round figures, $5 million. They've been very successful in a formal life. Maybe they were an investment banker or something like that. And they're they thought, well, maybe I'll go manage my own money. And then a few years down the track, they're like, oh, maybe I'll let other people invest alongside me. And I guess it creates a good incentive structure. Um, the, so what I'm getting at here, guys, if, if, if you take nothing away from this, I think the big thing here is fees. If the best analogy of why fund managers underperform is um, to, to imagine a bell curve, and many of your younger readers perhaps will know that a bell curve from their time at high school where they would get you know, a, a score at the end of their exams and they would then be placed into universities. And what happens when you have a bell curve is if you have all of the high fee fund managers on one end or the really good performers on one end um, and then you have the really bad performers on the other end, if by, by choosing a fund manager with um, a lower fee structure, you're effectively moving the entire bell curve to one side and you're moving that towards your favour. So when some index investors say, oh, you know, there's... Uh, only 5% of active fund managers have outperformed over the past year. Well, if you actually take away the impact of fees, you see that maybe it's not 5%, maybe it's 25% or 30%. Yeah. And so yeah. that, that's an important distinction. And, and that's just about tilting the odds in your favor. So this is, um, I agree that there's, you know, aligning to the right incentives, you know, a fund manager that's got a high water mark that only takes fees when they're making profits for their over benchmarks. But the vast majority of the industry is still stuck on a funds under management model where they charge fees based on how much funds they've got. While it potentially can impact the investor's returns, and it does, what are some of the other conflicts that that creates for the fund manager in terms of longer term impacting the investment fund? Yeah, well, you guys have talked about compounding of fees and you've talked about interest and, and those types of things and how kind of you know, interest is kind of the opposite of compounding. But if you're looking at fund managers, this, this is a really important insight, right? There are more fund managers in the US than there are stocks on the stock market. And, oh. and, and, if, and if, you hear, if you hear in Australia, there are hundreds to choose from, hundreds of fund managers, yet there are only 2,000 or just over 2,000 shares. And to be honest, to be frank, 70% of them probably shouldn't be on the stock market because they're rubbish. So, mm. um, you know, if you take that, you can pretty much be... I guess the simplest way to put it is you can be very choosy. Um, mm. You know, with property, you know, it's important to see the, the forest from the trees uh, and in shares and in fund, funds management, it's exactly the same thing. So I would say to anyone listening to this, be very, very, very choosy of who you, who you uh, consider investing with. Follow their incentives. Also, just understand how frank they are. At the top of the show, we talked about how people need to be candid and, and transparent with their losses. I think the, the phrase from... The Wolf of Wall Street, dare I quote it, was, don't judge me on my winner, 
on my winners, judge me on my losers because I have so few. Um, but most fund managers would be happy to bury that information or just not talk about it. So I know that there are a couple of fund managers who are very prevalent in Australia in um, the retail investor landscape. So, you know, mums and dad investors, if we could um, be so general. Um, and they tend to, I guess, use a lot of double speak. So what I mean by double speak is that the language that's between the lines. So what are they not saying to you? And I've always found it refreshing when someone says, yeah, we lost a lot of money. It's going to take us time. We're sorry. This is uh, interesting, isn't it? It was funny. We had actually a a, um, comment on our Facebook page only this week about, um, you know, overly positive uh, discourse, you know, that sort of American sales, Mm. salesy type um, approach. And it, engenders a little bit of a disbelief it's like hang on a minute you're not talking it's not balance you're not talking about the reality of the situation you're not talking about yeah. the fact that it's not possible to out for every single investment to outperform it's what lessons have you learned um you know what direction what pivots do you make what what directional changes what adjustments will you make because of what you know that learning and it is interesting. The same in property. It's exactly the same in property. It's 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 yeah. you can't lose, and that sort of that message that's out there. It's still out there. I can't believe it's still out there. But the overwhelming evidence to the contrary. Um, I also think that's interesting that with the share market as well, the investors are probably more likely, or if you're a do-it-yourself investor, for instance, is more likely to dabble, you know. And so we mm. talk about active investors in property, for instance, and that an active investor would be somebody who uh, buys a property to renovate, you know, maybe a flipper or maybe someone who renovates to rent out and then manages it themselves. Mm. You know, that's that's what you call an active investor in, in property. It takes a lot of time, takes a lot of money to do that. But in the share market, an active investor can be, you know, you can get in with 500 bucks and start start dabbling around, right? And so maybe that people have a bit of a, a different approach because they're not, they don't feel like they're risking as much and it's a bit more of a game. Do you think that that might apply to some do-it-yourselfers? Oh, absolutely. So we've just talked about funds management here. Um but we could also talk about individual shares. And yeah, yeah you see that all the time. So um, I think, you know, a really good question to ask yourself is, is very simple. And this does not apply to shares, but it, it applies to anything, which is to say, just ask yourself, what sucks? And if you <laughs> ask yourself what sucks, um, you're inverting the logic. And again, I'll quote Charlie Munger, who says, it is easier um, to avoid doing something stupid than it is to seek brilliance. And so people tend to think that they are brilliant um, and they might be God's gift to share trading or um, they might just throw 500 bucks here, a thousand bucks there, whatever. Um, But the reality is it's actually what I've found studying some of the best investors and speaking with extremely, extremely wealthy people and, and learning from their families and their stories is that the first rule is effectively not to lose money. And, um, you know, it doesn't matter if it's 500 bucks or, you know, 5,000 or 50,000, if you're going to invest in something, I would say to anyone, um, the only difference between investment property and $500 is that I guess the amount of money involved, you know, we think, um, we think in our business, when we're doing our research, uh, something I'll ask is if we're going to make this, uh, you know, some a share idea or recommendation or whatever, we think, you know, I asked them, sorry, our team, it's effectively, would you put all of your money in this? Mm-hmm. And, and if you're not prepared to put a significant majority of your money into something, you clearly haven't done the work and you clearly mm-hmm. don't have, I guess, the right to invest in that. And I guess it was a little bit different for me. So just going back a bit, when I started investing, I started with a few thousand dollars of my own um, and I kind of just bought anything. My friend and I went through the, the, the Fin Review and we went to yeah. the, the shares table and he was like, oh, I've Telstra, maybe I'll buy Telstra. I was like, no, 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 mate, listen to me whatever went up yesterday, buy that. And it was this tiny little thing um, that was probably like one cent. Um, and he, needless to say, a few months later, he pretty much lost everything because he sold out 70%, 80% down or whatever. But mm. what the, 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 what I quickly realized was that um, my parents who had a small amount of money, uh, we're talking like 30 grand um, to invest, they, um, they didn't know how to start investing, but I'd been studying it and I'd started – Uh, You could call it experimenting or dabbling, um, speculating if you like. Um, Once I started to take on their money, so their $30,000, it was a totally different thing for me. It was like (laughs) the world just flipped upside down. It's like, okay, first things first, I can't lose their money. 
Yeah. I can I can risk my own, but I can't lose theirs. And that just that mindset shifted. And then I started to really do my homework. And to be honest, it doesn't matter if it's five hundred dollars, because that's a lot of money to people, to some mm. people, or fifty thousand. I'd say, you know, one dollar invested now should be seventeen, depending on how old your audience is. Um, which should be seventeen by the time you retire if you do it right. So um, you know, that's the way I think about it. Every dollar is is precious. Love it. I mean, the, every dollar is precious. It's just interesting. I often think, you know, you hear stories of Kerry Packer going to casino and losing, you know, $10 million and then or winning and tipping uh, the croupiers, you know, paying their mortgages off. And I was just reading about this <laughs> during the week. And I find that astounding that uh, anybody, I mean, it's proportionate, of course, but anybody would be comfortable and okay with gambling that amount of money and losing that amount of money um and so and it, it, but it is proportional isn't it because of course the thing is like you were saying that you were risking yours but then when you looked at your parents it was that was all they had in a way hmm. so I mean how can we really change the way that we actually look at investing when there is this sort of culture of risk around and risk taking you know some people will take more risk and are prepared to lose because they focus on the gains whereas other people are focused on the what they could lose and so therefore they don't take any risk you know what I mean so how do we how do we navigate this whole risk taking because there's some risk is essential but too much is ridiculous Mm. yeah so David Gardner who's the one of the co-founders from the Motley Fool in the US um, he said imagine that the stock market wasn't called the stock market. Imagine it's called the business market. And if you imagine that instead of calling them stocks, we call them businesses. So instead of ticker symbols, we have names of companies and that's all we could see. If people just flick that switch in their mind, they would realize that, hey, it's not necessarily um, about things going up or down one day, green lights, red lights flashing in your face. It's actually about, you know, businesses. And behind every business, as Peter Lynch would say, there's a company, so you should find out what it's doing. And for us, it's it's very much the case. What we find with the definition of risk in the stock market, so in property, you don't when you when you walk out and you grab the the, the newspaper off your front lawn each morning, you don't turn around and say, Oh, my my property's gone up zero point two percent today. Uh, yep. Maybe I should sell, right? Um, but in the stock market, that same person who's walked out, grabbed their newspaper, walked back inside with a cup of coffee, would log into their share brokerage account um, and they would see a price that's either gone up or down and they think, oh, yep. maybe it's time to buy or sell. And there's really no basis for that. But a definition of risk, according to academics in the stock market, is what we call volatility. So just the ups and downs of share prices. Um, and, you know, that's completely, when you think about that, if you were owning a business, let's say you had a cafe, um, you wouldn't necessarily go down the street and, and and look at all the competing cafes and say, oh, the price of that one's gone up 0.2% today. Mine only um, went, you know, went down 0.1%. Therefore, the other one's more volatile um, and therefore it's more risky. You would just be like, yeah. if someone came up to you, you'd probably lock them up in a mental institution because you'd probably say, <laughs> that actually has no basis in reality. You're off in a different different world. And the same thing should be applied to the share market. The problem is we don't know. Most people don't know the difference between risk and risk. Most people think mm. that risk is volatility because that's what the academics mm. tell us. But in reality, you guys running this podcast, if you made it a business, my business, anyone's business could have shares in it. And the real risk is that that business no longer makes a profit. It doesn't pay dividends. It doesn't grow, all of these types of things. So if we could just convince people that the stock market should actually be called the business market, I think we'd have a lot more people willing to take risk. Um, of course, of course, there's fundamentals, what we call fundamentals in investing, which would be um, you know, akin to investment-grade property. There are things that we look for in companies that make yep. one better than the other. And then there's this overlay, there's this veil, if you like, of um, behavior, which is what we came back to at, coming back to the start. But there's a behavioral element that sits between um, the reality, which is that shares are just businesses, and share prices. Yep. And oftentimes you can see a disconnect between those two. And it's that behavior, if you can master that, you can cut right through all of the jargon, you can cut right through all of the nonsense, and you can focus on the business. And that's I guess, a really important insight when it comes to taking risk. And I'm not sure if we'll get to this, but um, I'm sure you guys have met Tina. Tina stands for there is no alternative. 
And what it means is that with interest rates so low, with unemployment being so so, um, with bond yields virtually zero, um, and I guess term deposits offering negative because uh, after inflation you have to factor that in, there yeah. is no alternative to investing and taking risk. And so the sooner that people realise the difference between risk and risk, um, the better off they'll be. Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting when you flip it from stock markets. Stock markets created uh, over many years um, fear attached to it because, you know, every day it's commented on in the radio, the newspapers, the TV, et cetera, and it's markets going up. It goes up 1%, but when it falls, it falls $40 billion, and that scares the hell out of people. Where does... If you change it in your mind to businesses, how does capitalism as a global sort of structure play into the stock market long term and give investors confidence to just bet on that rather than just, you know, sitting on the sidelines? Yeah, that's a great one. So the title of your of your podcast is The Elephant in the Room. And there's a brilliant book, probably the most profound book I've ever read, um, which is, and now I'm going to forget it off the top of my head, but basically... Um, it's to do with the, the size instinct. So what we, what we find is that um, people tend to, and the media loves this, by the way, people tend to jump to a number and think, well, that's really big because it's no, there's no basis in reality for it insofar mm. as we can't say 40 billion. Geez, that's a lot of money. Like there's so many zeros attached to that. I forget how many zeros there are. But if you say $4, then obviously it's a totally different thing. And what it takes is a bit of context around that. Um, so just think... You know, um, this this business or this industry, sorry, is is built on, I guess, the foundations of capitalism if we think of the stock market as representing businesses. And I think there's no better example of that than coronavirus and the impact that that's had on society. So my wife and I were talking about this, and she's an occupational therapist, so she's not in finance, although I've given her a pretty good education. Um, she, <laughs> we, we talked about this, and we hear in the news things like stock market down 40 billion wiped off the ASX, whatever. Um, And then we hear unemployment spiking. And then we hear this business closing, that business closing. Like I'm just sitting here in Melbourne, I can walk out of the office and there's a dry cleaner that has two signs on the window and it says it proudly in business for 30 years. And then the next sign says closing down. And so um, you see these things and they're all tragic, right? That's really just pulling on our fear. And yeah, And the important point with capitalism is that what we've seen in coronavirus is that businesses have adapted. If if we have two cafes that sell the same uh, coffee and one sells it for $4.50 and another one sells it for $4, we would just go to the one that's $4. And the reason we do that is because capitalism works. We we as consumers want the lowest price and, and if the company can offer that for a better price and it's the same or fungible product, we will go to that. And during coronavirus, we had, we had an episode on our podcast recently where we talked about, um, I guess, inspiring coronavirus pivots. And one of the ones was an eco-lodge that would usually be you know, akin to a bed and breakfast, turning, mm. in, turning into um, a pizza shop. So they had a pizza oven on site and they thought of an innovative way to fill demand. And you know, in a capitalist society, that is delivering value to a consumer or customer and you do it and you make a profit and that's how capitalism works. And capitalism is often a dirty word because we think of like oil tycoons yeah. or super rich people and inequality and all these things that the media yeah. has drummed into us. But capitalism is the reason we have a society. It's the reason we have roads. It's the reason we have uh, airports, schools, hospitals, you name it. And so um, people, businesses need to make money. And you as someone who is investing, um, you need to realize that the sooner you you can take advantage of that, the better. Tony Robbins in his book, Unshakable, says, don't be a consumer of the economy, own the economy. And, and, and that's the basis of that is built on capitalism. I find it, it is really interesting. A lot of um, debate around the moment, is this the end of capitalism, the showing the weaknesses of capitalism, et cetera, et cetera. And capitalism, you know, I'm a conscious capitalist, right? And um, mm. in fact, that, and I actually joined the Association in Australia um, following listening to the Motley Fool podcast. Mm funnily enough. Um, but there's there's sort of two sides of it. It's the good side, the creative side, the 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 way that we feel demand, we respond to the market, we deliver what what is needed and wanted. But there's also the side that creates demand really where it's not necessary. And I think that's capital capitalism gone bad, you know. And there's also the choices that are made where the economy is chosen over individual health um, and society 
you know, choices and all that sort of stuff. So we can sort of go down that path. But on the on the sort of what I think is probably one of the bad sides of capitalism is is watching the share market volatility and the things that it responds to. You know, mm-hmm. so it responds to announcements by Trump, for instance, and goes up. And and there's there's a whole bunch of what looks on the surface to be really insane stuff that drives the the share market as a whole. So what's going on there? Hmm. That's a good point. Um, first, I should say, uh, never base your investment decisions on what Trump says, but <laughs> <laughs> or tweets rather. Maybe that's more, more yeah. thing, especially at three a.m. Um, so I guess the thing here is that, and this is a, another important insight, right? Is that when we invest, um, we invest looking through the, the windshield. We don't look through the rearview mirror. And that is quite concerning to people because pe- most people would be like, you know what, Telstra's paid a pretty good dividend for five years. Yep. Uh, that therefore makes it a good investment. Well, no, not necessarily. Because what happens is in the stock market, remember how we talked about there's fundamentals and there's behavior. In the stock market, if we look through the if we look front on, if we're driving straight ahead, we want to know what direction it's going. And we do that on the basis of individual companies. We say, Telstra looks like it's going to grow. Telstra looks like it's not going to grow. So what, what, what basis do we have for that? And then what we do is we, as investors, we, we can think about the future and we say, we expect Telstra is going to pay this dividend or that dividend, for example. And then we, we estimate that, say, let's pick a number, five years out into the future. And we say, yeah. we think it's going to pay this much in dividends over the next five years, and the time value of money or compounding tells us that we need to discount those dollars back to today. So what you could have is effectively um, any news that is new to the market. So like it's a tweet, it's a you know a piece of ge- geopolitical news, a new tax um, legislation that's drafted and put through parliament, what have you. Any piece of news doesn't affect necessarily what the price was yesterday. It affects what's going to happen in the future. And because we're not just talking about today or tomorrow, the present, we're talking about many years into the future. So, for example, if we lowered taxes for companies from 30% to 15% in Australia, what we would find is that companies are going to pay half as much tax, but not just for this year, for forever, according to our assumption, or at least for five years if we were forecasting five years out. So the the share market can react in really strange ways to different pieces of information. But the important part is if if you're looking at individual companies as opposed to the stock market as a whole, is to understand how they impact the individual businesses. If we go back to our coffee example, a cut in the corporate tax rate um, or big corporate tax, a big company corporate tax rate from 30 to 15% probably wouldn't have that much of an impact because most small businesses don't pay 30%. They might pay less than 30%. So the, the cut probably wouldn't affect them as much as, say, a large company. And so when we think about news surfacing, it's important to remember that the stock market is the value of things to come, not necessarily what's happened in the past. And, and that's that's really interesting. I mean, I guess to use your coffee, cafe analogy, you're sort of saying, well, if one coffee shop had uh, a main road that was suddenly going to be built right in front of it, each share price would go down versus the one that's opposite the park and is mm. in a better position, a quieter position. So that's sort of on that micro level. But it is. But don't you think it's a bit of a dichotomy? Because the, the thing is that what you're saying there is that the share market as a whole responds by thinking of the future impact of legislation changes to the environment etc cetera, etc cetera. but the reality is we're also talking about behavioral biases and individuals reactions to mm. some of this stuff so it's chicken and egg isn't it An individuals reacting to the way that the share market is behaving so then what is then the share market do you know what i mean yeah yeah that's a good that's a good one so um there are, there are a number of really good books that um i could maybe follow up with an email so you could include them, but yeah, um, the, the, the best definition I've found of the share market is not to look through it through a mathematical lens, so not through like a, a strict like this equals that kind of lens, but yeah. to look at it as more of, um, I, I guess, through a biological lens. So think of it as a complex system or an organism that is constantly changing and morphing over time. And, mm. and what you have is a bunch of different people acting within that system, just like you'd have cells within some sort of, um, I guess some sort of plant or animal and they all do a different thing and they all act in a different way, but they all fulfill this kind of long-term vision. But what you have over time is that, um, yes, the share market can react bizarrely in the short term 
And this come this will come back to when we talk about, I guess, investing as opposed to gambling and opposed to um, everything else, is that Yes, things can happen in the short term. Like right now, we have some companies on the stock exchange, particularly technology companies, that are going crazy. Yeah. And then we have other companies that are not. And over time, and this was an insight going back as far as the 1920s from a guy called Benjamin Graham, who was the mentor of Warren Buffett. And he said that in the short run, um, the market is a voting machine. So whatever's popular tends to do really well. So when you react to news... Um, you tend to react really favorably to things that are really popular at the time. So like a buy now, pay later company would be very popular right now. But over time, it's a weighing machine. And what he meant by that is, you know, maybe if you take five or 10 years as your time horizon, the best companies tend to do well. And if we go back to the cafe analogy, and I'll conjure my David Gardner again, um, he says that if you have three cafes on the street, don't try and time your way into which one's going to come out with a new blend of coffee or, you know, which one's <laughs> going to have a new sign out the front. Don't try and do that. And don't try and buy and sell each individual cafe. Just find the best cafe on the street and own that forever because that is going to be the, the surest way to make money. And so if we if we think about that, yes, the share market can do strange and bizarre things in the short run. But over time, you want to find the best companies. And one thing I might just circle back to is this idea about conscious capitalism and avoiding, I guess, the companies that do bad. You don't have to own everything. But what I would say on that is over time, I don't know about you guys, but for me, I believe that companies have tended to move, if I could bring in some, um, I guess, political speak, I would say that most good companies in the 21st century have moved towards the center left. And what I mean by that is they tend to, the companies that are more sustainable in this day and age tend to be those that also have an ethical focus. So they focus on the triple bottom line, you know, your society, um, the environment and profits. If you like what you're hearing here, please share this episode with others you feel would benefit. And while you're at it, why not leave us an iTunes review? Five stars, please. Every review helps make it easier for other people to find us and hear what our amazing guests have to say. We love hearing your questions and we're planning more listener Q&A episodes. Please send your questions in. You can send them via the website, which is theelephantintheroom.com.au or directly via email to questions at theelephantintheroom.com.au. I agree with you in terms of, yes, the best companies are the best things to hold, right? Because you want to own those quality companies that will survive and be sustainable and have great profits in the future. But where does the price you pay to buy that company come into that? Because, you know, for example, like Tesla at the moment, right? Mm. It's you know bigger than all the car manufacturers in the world. It's gone up 15% last night as an example. Um and, you know, yes, it potentially is the best vehicle manufacturer out there, but you have to pay an enormous price to buy it today. So where does the price that you buy that company come into it? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I've often heard that um, the money is made in property on the way in. And mm. I've, I've heard in shares that people have missed out on tremendous opportunities because they focused on what they would say is quote unquote value. And... Um, these are important concepts, I guess, in mathematics and in reality, because the price is what you pay, but the value is what you get. And yeah. so you do have to have some appreciation for this. But some people kind of shroud this in mystery that, oh, there's a valuation for the stock and that this broker just put out a, a target price and what have you. Yeah. But again, I'll come back to the idea that if you focus on a very long time horizon, and you focus on a really good business. Um, I can give you an example, which is a company from Australia called Pushpay. Um, Pushpay, even though I say it's from Australia, we just claim everything that comes out of New Zealand that's good. Um, uh, so this is a company originally from um, New Zealand, listed here in Australia on the stock market, but does most of its business in the US. And what, is it, what does it do? Well, Pushpay is a software business that works with churches to get them more donations. And so... They sell their software to churches via subscriptions or via like a percentage of the the, the, the teething that goes through, the, the donations. And so um, for years, Pushpay was not making a profit. And um, I guess the only people that could really see value in it, we bought it a long time ago, but the only people that could really see value in it were people that understood how software works. And the software, mm. um, I know you guys have talked about this in the past, about how you have these businesses that charge subscription fees. And 
Um, what you could see with a company like Pushpay is unprofitable, looked like it was sky high valuation. But again, if you focus on the future of that business and the ability for it to serve more and more churches with virtually the same app, um, you begin to realize how it could make more and more money without laying out a lot more money. And so I'm not, I couldn't say that I'm intimately familiar with Tesla. Um, what I would say is that there's a very uh, charismatic and energetic CEO who mm-hmm. tends to make the headlines and help that one way or the other. But yep. um, it sooner or later does come back to, I guess, a reasonable price. But what I've found in my time in the stock market and from interviewing you know, the best investors in the country is that... Um, Oftentimes, people have a really good appreciation for the value of something one to three years out. So they can say, you know, in the next two to three years, I feel like, you know, Tesla's electric cars are going to, they're going to do this much in production and that's going to happen and that's going to happen. But one thing that many investors, um, I guess, don't have an ability to price in or to value is the the optionality that comes with a company. So um, if you bought Amazon shares back in 2001, you would have thought that this is a tremendous online bookstore. But then it wasn't until 2015 yeah. or you know the 2010s that you realize that, hey, this has got the biggest server network in the world. And the, now the most profitable thing isn't its books. It's not even its e-commerce business. It's actually its ability to sell service space to uh, millions of customers around the world. So when it comes back to valuation, there's a few things. I'll give you some shorthand tricks that we use. One, you, your business has got to be cash flow positive or it's going to be in a position to be cash flow positive. Yep. Number two, we always look at businesses that we would have that we would say have a competitive advantage or a moat. So like the ring around a castle, it protects the business and it protects its cash flow. And so, um, in the case of Pushpay, which is this ter- church donation software, the the very simple um, moat that it has is that once it is installed in a church, it's very hard for the hundreds, sometimes tens of thousands of churchgoers yeah. to uh, uninstall that app and move to a different system. Mm, and so yeah. that protects its profits. And so. If we look at just cash flow positive companies, that would rule out probably 50% of the companies on the ASX. Um, I don't know, that's just a guess, but there's a lot that don't even make a, a dime. So um, that would be one thing. The next thing would be focus on companies that have a moat. And the next thing would be focus on companies that you can understand and only those companies that you can understand. Because if you focus on, if you try and think about something that you don't understand, you'll never be able to put a value on it. You'll never be able to say, I think it's worth this much. Um, there are some other shorthand things um, which we could probably talk for about three days on and still not get anywhere um, under the surface. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it, there are many different things. Value yeah. is very important, but I would say focus on the business first and foremost and yeah. yep, just accumulate assets. So millennials, you've got a great education business. You write amazing articles, the podcast, you know, creating a lot of um, content and understand uh, I guess millennials, what, how do they think about property and what worries them the most first in that kind of property versus shares debate? Yeah, I think the big one that comes across my desk is I have a deposit, or at least I think I have a deposit, which might be say twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars. I'm trying to buy a house for six hundred thousand, which means that if I want to get to twenty percent, it's one hundred and twenty. But it's going to take me two or three years to get there. Do I invest that money in the share market in the short term? And that's the question that I get a lot from millennials. So interesting. Yeah, it's how do I make my deposit grow quicker? And yeah. this has only been, I guess, um, made worse by what we've seen in recent years, which is interest rates falling. Like back when our, back yeah. when my parents were looking at houses, they were probably getting ten or twenty percent interest, or not twenty percent, ten or fifteen percent interest on <laughs> on a term deposit, right? And now um, you'd be lucky to get one percent. And so I think the difference for millennials now is, you know, we've just got the really the only option for us is to save or to take risk or to mm. push out our timeline by a few years and in, maybe invest in some way. But um, so that's probably the big thing. And I can certainly understand this because I'm actually, believe it or not, I'm 29, right? I'm 29 and I'm looking for my first house. I've never bought a house. I've never invested in property other than outside of ETFs and REITs or real estate mm. investment trusts. And so I'm looking for my first house and I would, I mean, not to butter my own bread here, but I would say I earn a decent wage, right? My wife being an occupational therapist, she earns a decent wage as well. Um, But at the same time, we're finding it very difficult to, um, I guess, justify spending the amount of money that would be required to buy a house 
And by the way, obviously, I only want to buy quote unquote investment grade property, so I'm pretty picky. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so uh, I could move somewhere else, but I don't want to. <laughs> and so I, I guess we we try we find it hard to justify the trade off between shares and between property. Um, obviously, they're totally separate asset classes. But um, yeah, that's kind of a roundabout. That's something that's on my mind a lot as well. It's interesting. Let's talk about- yeah, well, yeah, go on, Veronica. Well, yeah, it, it is interesting you say that that trade off because, of course, you're very uh, familiar with the share market. You understand it, obviously, it's your profession. So, um, one of the things that uh, obviously the big difference is leverage. And obviously the fact is you can't live in a share. So <laughs> if you don't buy your own home, you're going to be paying rent elsewhere. So there's there all those other factors that come into play, correct? Mm. Absolutely. How are you balancing those? How, I mean, I guess, how, what is your thinking? I, I know that you said you are struggling to balance them. What is your thinking? What are the things that you are considering in that in that debate? Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, I guess the capitalist in me is um, is very simple. Uh, is very is very simple in the way I think about it. But uh, so the, the way I think about it is, I want to put my money where I can maximize my return. And mm. so much of the time, um, we think about. Uh, property as using leverage. And I don't think enough people consider the risk that's involved in leverage. I think a lot of those people are going to consider that in the next 12 months. But yep. um, I don't think for a long time because of this unwinding of interest rates um, and the net migration and all these wonderful things that we've had, I think people have kind of overlooked that risk. But I've always yep. thought of leverage as kind of artificially inflating something. So it's like kind of saying, yep. you know, I've got, a, I've got a guitar at home. Um, if I plug it into my amplifier, being the debt, it doesn't make a difference. If I'm a good guitarist, um, it won't make a difference whether I'm just playing it so I can hear it or playing it so other people can hear it. It's going to be good music. But if I'm a shit guitarist and I plug that into a, an amp, then everyone's going to hear it and it's going to make matters <laughs> a lot worse. And so, yeah. and so I, the way I think about it is as an investor, where can I put my capital, my equity or cash to the maximum so it has the maximum possible return for like, or probabilistically speaking, anyhow. And so for me, being in the share market um, for well, around about 10 years now, um, I think to myself, if I can compound my money at between 10 and 20% per annum, um, and the yields on property, regardless of the debt element, aren't there yet for me, then mm. I, sh- I should keep allocating to, to shares. And this is what my wife and I have long been, um, I guess, torn over is that I probably, and I'm, Maybe I am kicking myself a little bit, but I probably could have bought a house um, when I was early 20s, like very early 20s, but I didn't yet. Instead, I went into shares and I didn't use leverage and I didn't get ahead of, say, some of my peer group might have. Um, but, and then I've also had to pay you know, living costs since then. I've had rent and, and what have you. Um, so that's definitely something that comes into the personal finance side. My, my kind of feedback to anyone that asks me this question is, yeah. um, and it's like that, that young girl in the, um, the tortilla ad or the taco ad, like, you know, do you want the hard shells or do you want the soft shells? And she says, <laughs> why not have both? And with me, with shares, I yeah. often say to people, if you are in this first homeowner bracket, save your deposit. If that's your goal, you should be saving towards that as much as you can. However, don't think that just because you're saving for a deposit, you can't invest in shares. As you said, you can do it with $500. You can even do it with mm-hmm. less with one of these micro investing apps. So why not just um, fork some of your income or your cash flow to shares and some of it to your deposit. So you get the best of both worlds. And I think that's really good because it's a psychological nudge for people too because they don't feel like they're missing out on anything. They don't think, oh, you know, this guy just came on the podcast and said, hey, your money's going backwards in a term deposit. You know, oh, you know, I've actually, I'm actually learning to invest in shares and I'm learning to invest in ETFs um, because I've got $500 or I've got uh, $2,000. Yeah. And that is enough sometimes for people to scratch that itch and still keep saving and then they can learn as they go. I really love your point around leverage because I think you're 100 percent right. It's it's a massive positive for prices. You know that's what drives a lot of prices long term is people borrowing. You know taking their hundred thousand and borrowing nine hundred thousand and then putting another million dollars into the property market. And that's kind of what keeps pushing prices up. And that potentially um, can work if you buy a good asset because you know the good asset rises, but a lot of people don't understand the problems with leverage if it goes wrong, you know, and I think that's where a lot of first home buyers, you know, or people who are buying investment properties don't really think through when, you know, you're only buying 
borrowing 80, 90% of the money, Tony takes a five or 10 or 20% fall in prices for you to lose absolutely everything. Um, and I think that, you know, the leverage, it's, it's, it's two sides to it. And I think uh, a lot of people in the property market kind of, you know, encourage people to go and leverage their money, but then not enough focus is put on, well, it actually can go both ways. I think one thing around leverage is that a lot of people in property, particularly if they're looking at buying their first property, um, let's just say investment for a minute, not home, they're thinking, okay, well, I don't want to borrow too much because I fear, you know, owing that much, right? So I might limit myself with say 400,000. That feels safe. That feels comfortable. And they then go out and make the mistake of buying what they can afford with that self-imposed budget, if that is self-imposed. And that means that they often go and buy a really crap asset because Mm. they've actually... um, fail to realise the risk in that case isn't in the borrowing, it's actually in the asset. Well, it's actually in every case it's in the asset. The risk is in the asset. But if you borrow to buy a crap asset, then you've just compounded the risk as well. And mm. so and this is this is a, um, a fear thing that a lot of property buyers, particularly first-time buyers, do think, you know, or they're, they're also trying to diversify. Like, oh, well, I can't put all my eggs in one really good property. I have to then carve it up into two or three really little ones, really crappy ones in terrible locations yeah. or substandard properties. And so they fail to understand and it feels less risky, but the reality is it's actually more risky. So it's a real paradox. Hmm. I, think, I think that's a really good point you guys make. It's, it, it's, de- it's definitely an enabler for some people um, and it can be, I guess, a good thing or a bad thing. And we've yeah. heard the, I guess, um, the saying of good debt versus bad debt. And mm-hmm. um, I guess it's in this instance, the debt itself is not the good or the bad bit. It's actually the asset that you buy. And yeah. yes. you know, if, you, if you take out a loan to buy a TV, that's probably not a good debt. But if you take out a loan to buy a really good investment grade property, um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good debt to have. And um, I think that's where a lot of people do or don't go right. So um, I, I hardly agree with you on that. So on the lifestyle, I'm in your situation. So uh, thinking about buying the first property, um, I assume this is a property you're going to live in. Is, yeah. Is, yeah. So if, for example, what's the alternative there? Because you know how you mentioned around Tina before. Um, is there a, the alternative, let's say, long-term for you as a couple and family, et cetera, um, are you thinking I'm just going to potentially rent long-term and invest in shares um, and, or am I potentially and avoid property altogether or are you thinking I'm just going to invest in shares for another five years then buy property? Like what are the two options you're thinking about? Yeah, so that's um, that's a really good question. I guess um, I always get – so this is funny, right? As someone who's a qualified financial planner, I don't give personal advice, by the way. We only give general advice. But yeah. um, as someone who's a qualified financial planner, it might sound a bit strange when I say this, but I often get a bit of anxiety when it comes to a financial plan. And the reason why I do – and this is for my own, of course. I'd happily give someone yeah. else advice. But um, so the reason I do is that – I like to live my life um, with some very simple tenets. And and some of those are just um, put your money where it's best used. That's probably the first one. So if we talk about finances, because I don't like to see my life played out on a, on a spreadsheet. It sounds weird, but yeah, um, I, yeah, so, so yeah. I maximize my um, savings wherever possible. My wife and I do this. We sit down and we have a budget um, and we maximize our uh, returns for whatever amount of capital that we have. And um, when we think a bit longer term, it's it's only been in the recent few years that we saw an opportunity. So we would be happily renting, to be honest. Um, but it was only in the recent years that we've, we've, and particularly in the last six months, we've thought maybe there's going to be an opportunity for us as um, people that principally invest in the stock market. Maybe there's going to be an opportunity for us to deploy some of our capital for a deposit um, and get take advantage of these extremely low interest rates and even potentially lower house prices in certain areas. And so um, what we've done is we've kind of set out on this bit of a a mission and we've decided that we're not going to sell our shares, we're going to keep adding to them, but we've decided to save outside of that. And so as soon as it gets to the the limit that we believe is acceptable, which we think we're at that now, um, then we'll, we're, we're already in the pre-approval process. Uh, once we get to that, which we are, then we can start buying and we look to buy houses in suburbs that we believe are investment grey, where there's supply constraint, those types of things. Um, mm. But there's really no grand plan, Chris. I would say it's more so, um, you know, two to three years out for us. Um, we don't want to sacrifice and pay the tax man from anything that's in our shares 
but we do want to obviously have somewhere to live. And we recognize um, Peter O'Malley had a really good book on this and um, it, it was a property book. And he talked about how, you know, you want to look at, uh, at properties when I guess the, the cost of ownership is, is lower than um, the cost of rent. And we've, I think in our areas, we've definitely reached that. So if, again, coming back to that capital component, we're at that. So now we just save until we find the, the place that's right for us. We just got to compete with about 120 other buyers. That's about it. Well, the problem is also that the rents are reducing. So that, that equation's going to change. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All of a sudden- I think in Melbourne, because you're in Melbourne, I think there is a lot of potential, um, accommodation from a renting point of view not just apartments but even houses in good areas i feel like there's a lot more potential options in melbourne if you don't want to buy you can rent Mm. Um, and so have you actually thought through in terms of like a longer term sort of lifestyle sort of family have you do you feel that your desire to move from renting to own home ownership is growing each year or do you feel like even if, for example, kids and things like that, you would want to just rent long term. Uh, yeah, yeah. So kids is an important uh, factor because you have stability, obviously, when you're in your own home. I've got a friend who he actually he got interviewed on the ABC because he went on a rant on Twitter about how he'd moved house five times in seven years, not because he wanted to, but because the landlord said we're selling or we're moving. And this was in Sydney. But, mm. uh, yeah. but here in Melbourne, you're absolutely spot on, Chris. There are a lot of places to rent. Um, yeah. You know, maybe when we come to the back of the show, I'll share one story with you. But, uh, yeah, when we think longer term, we do want that stability. So I think naturally my wife and I were at that part of our, our life cycle where we think, yeah. you know, we do need to prepare for, for children. We don't have them yet. But in the next two to three years, she would probably say two. I'd probably say three. But probably <laughs> in the next two to three years, uh, we'll be ready for that. And um, absolutely that factors in. And then so then we think, okay, this first home, um, I've got my eyes are bigger than my stomach, or I should say my expectations uh, are definitely outsiz- outsizing the reality of the situation here in Melbourne because <laughs> even <not> if, alone. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I'm thinking, yeah, you know, I've got a pretty good job, we've got savings, you know, all this sort of stuff. And, Surely that buys yeah. us more than what yeah, I can come see. Come on, come on, we're special, <laughs> we're special. Give us some treatment yeah. here. Um, but what we found is that we're not going to get to our dream home in the first step. We may have to, unfortunately, not unfortunately, we'll have to find a smaller but still equally attractive um, investment, a home that becomes eventually, I hope, an investment for us. And yep. so we think maybe it's a five-year plan in, insofar as that, but we don't. We haven't really set anything in concrete coming back to not really setting plans. We've kind of just... Let's take it one step at a time. Let's find a yep. house that we think is investment grade um, that meets all of our requirements for children and then we can maybe parlay that into something else over time. Yeah. But you said they're a dream home. So I'm just curious to, as someone who has sees value in investing outside property and, and is able to generate good returns for all your knowledge and your experience and knowing not what to invest in, that ultimately sounds like there is still an aspiration for a home and a dream home, um, is that still something that's important to you? Or do you think that, you know, you'd still be happy just to live in a, you know, a smaller house or a cheaper house long term? Or is it ultimately a goal to get this dream property? Yeah, uh, yeah, there's absolutely a goal there. So um, the, 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 the great thing about money is if you have more of it, it's easier to do things with it. So um, the the thing is that if we just focus on some very simple tenants, we can get to that. And my dream home um, is actually, uh, being a country boy, is to go back and have land and have my kids grow up yep. in a place where they've got fresh air and, and what have you. Um, yep. And so I absolutely think that that's really important. But we've, or I more specifically, I've seen it as more of a lifestyle asset than an investment asset for a long time. Uh, whether or not that's, you know, whether that's right, we'll probably find out. In the, in the long run. But um, yeah. you know, in the meantime, I'm quite happy absolutely to find an investment grade property. And I think there are merits to investing in your own home or an investment property. Absolutely, I do. And I could see myself in 10 years having um, maybe two properties uh, to our name, but um, maybe, maybe not I would want, you know, this is a thing from, uh, I guess, philosophical point of view. I'd probably want everything to be positively geared. Um, that's just the way I see assets is that they should produce cash for you, not take cash away from your pocket. And, um, you know, I I think in 
yeah, 10 years, we'll probably have two properties under our belt. We might have um, a home that's on a farm, but one that's closer to town too. So, I mean, we've got to kind of wrap this up, but I think when you say around positively geared versus negatively geared, do you include the capital gains that you're making, for example, as part of that cash flow? You know, for example, let's say you buy some shares and they're not yielding much, but they're growing really strongly. Do you kind of accumulate those returns and say, well, that was actually a good investment? Or do you kind of think the property has to be positively cash flow and it doesn't matter about the growth or the increase in share price? Uh, so, you know, uh, it's probably, I'd like both. <laughs> so if I'm being so um, choosy and so selfish, I would want both. So um, I wouldn't <laughs> be averse to buying a property that was negatively geared, but my preference would be for it to be positively geared. In a similar way, you know, I would love a company that pays out, say, 30% of its profits to, uh, to yeah. shareholders, its dividends, and then uses the other 70% to grow its business viciously. And so... Mm. There's a company on the stock exchange called Prometicus, which we've owned for a very long period of time, um, very, very long period of time. And it is that exact case. So it has paid a dividend, yet it's a sexy tech stock. And what it's effectively found is that, you know, where our business is growing fast enough, we don't need that money, so we'll pay it back to you. And so uh, what you, I, I would like to think that I can find something offering a similar I guess, scenario in property. I Maybe I'm a bit ambitious again with my eyes being bigger than my stomach, but um, I think <laughs> that I could maybe uh, find a way to do that. Um, and th in that respect, um, I wouldn't be averse to buying an asset, uh, i.e. a property, with the expectation that it is a property for income as opposed to capital growth. That's interesting and I'm trying to wrap my head around how possibly that could be possible because obviously in a company, A, you've got revenues that generate profit. It's actually real money. You can then reinvest that back into the business to generate more revenues, et cetera, et cetera. But with property, the distinction between capital growth and your uh, revenue is really fixed mm. and I, you, I, you know, I, I don't know, maybe there's some clever ways to borrow against that capital growth and then uh, whatever, oh. but without making it very complicated. Um, the problem is, of course, with property, you've got that that thing, it's either high yield or high capital growth. So that's, that's a principle that doesn't necessarily always apply because there's plenty of low yielding properties that don't grow much either. Um, mm. But to get both, I, you know, I'd be amazed and I'd love to find one. <laughs> yeah, so so rather than um, rather than me talk to this as a kind of capital allocation, it's like a structure thing where money goes in and out. I think the best example is where, and the simple example where you guys would know better than I do, is that the rent is enough to cover all of the maintenance costs or the holding costs of that property. And so mm -hmm. that makes it, in my mind, positively geared. And then um, you can buy, hopefully, in an area that is potentially able to grow, whether it's compounding at, say, let's say a property in a particular suburb goes up at, say, 3 to 5% on average over a yeah. long period of time. But yeah. it also pays off your loan, which is, you know, 2 to 3%. Well, that's a 6% potential return, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, compounding yeah. away um, for, your, for your wealth. And so that's what I mean by a, a property that over a long period of time can compound quite well. Um, mm. I, do I think there's opportunities in the share market that outweigh that? Probably. But it's also yeah. a lot of opportunities that are not that and will go the wrong way. Mm. So um, so you're you know, not factoring in interest costs then? Oh, so let's say hypothetically I could get a, like hypothetically I could get a 4% yield, gross yield on a property um, mm. and my, my interest costs were 2.9% um, and I had, you know, obviously upkeep costs, other rates, what have you. Um, well, maybe it goes close to break even. Um, maybe it's slightly negative. Maybe it's slightly positive. But that's what I'd be looking for. I wouldn't buy something mm. with the intention to share some of that with the um, with the ATO. Perfect, mate. I guess um, <laughs> we would love to just uh, yeah. Have you got a property Dumbo for us? Yeah, I do, and I I, I probably shouldn't say it's a Dumbo, but um, it's something that I just that just come across my desk yesterday when I was uh, looking through Twitter. So, uh, uh, a user that I follow on there said that he had bought two properties, two studio apartments in Melbourne CBD, um, mm. and he's looked on the, the realestate.com.au website and found that there are 3,800 apartments to rent in Melbourne at the moment. Wow. And he, he hasn't, he originally had it as an Airbnb and hasn't um, had any takers, whether it's an Airbnb or for longer term rents, on, um, on his properties since February. And 
I, I, I you know, that you don't want to poke fun or anything like that. But I guess the lesson oh. there for me is that Ouch. Um, the lesson there for me is that if you are going to invest in property, carefully consider diversification or just anything really, not just property. Yeah. Consider the diversification angle. Consider what could go wrong because they could go wrong. It could happen and you could be in that situation. Wow. Um, it reminds me, I've just literally done it now because I remember doing it a couple of years ago. I typed in like Rosebury in New South Wales um, into real estate and just apartments and just thought, I wonder how many are for rent in Rosebury. And I remember it was about 800. Um, I've just <laughs> wow. looked literally just right now because it kind of, it, and it's 2,400. <gasps> wow. Um, Jesus. So, you know, and, and, that, that is, and that's just Rosebury. And like I know if you kind of expand the search and you add in like areas like Alexandria and Green Square and Mascot in Surrey Hills and Redfern, um, you know, the compounding, the problem compounds and that's what all those Renters will be considering all those suburbs, not just Rosebury, if they're thinking about an apartment. So, yeah, it's it's a pretty um, horrible situation to be is have an asset and not be able to sell it or not be able to rent it. Um, you just get left with an empty apartment and, you know, mm. crystallized losses if you sell. So, yeah, not a good outcome. And no. I wonder, actually, just as a bit of an aside and probably a whole episode on this topic, but I wonder if high-rise apartments will become less attractive given our social distancing requirements mm. you've got to get into a lift and you know with a uh, restricted amount of people can get into a lift how long it takes to get to your apartment etc 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 and I, and i know it's not quite the same with public housing in melbourne and i'm not sure when we go to air here but obviously they've just in the in the midst of a hard lockdown and yep. i know it's i know they're public tenants and i know that they've also got very very small lifts i know that they've also got quite a lot of people living in in each apartment no balconies you know um but i guess what that does shine the spotlight is um this type of living and if we're going to live with a pandemic, they don't necessarily coexist very comfortably, do they? No, not yeah, at all. I mean, the, apart the apartment market was in a lot of trouble. Uh, hasn't really risen in Melbourne and, and Brisbane like it did in Sydney just because there was this real FOMO and real lack of stock in the boom and everyone just went and competed on apartments. Um, and they can't afford houses, so their only option was apartments. But in Melbourne, they can still afford houses. And I think this kind of COVID situation is really, you know, it, disincentivize or people not interested in apartments and i think that's really going to smash the the values in in both brisbane and melbourne and potentially sydney so yeah yeah well, yeah i can i can certainly appreciate that sorry guys i i moved out of my apartment in hawthorne and we moved out of our apartment in hawthorne because we wanted to get away um yeah. from that scenario so we went back to out into the hills as we call it and and that's that yeah before i just i just remember the name of that book from earlier on it's called it's by hans rosling it's called factfulness fantastic book on understanding instincts and incentives factfulness i love it now i think your offer to uh include a list or send us a list of mm -hmm. um all the books that you've mentioned you're obviously very well read uh <laughs> would be wonderful and i think a lot of our listeners and, and myself included will uh probably devour that list and um we really appreciate your time today owen no thank you it's um i'm a big fan of the show uh, i'm you know, there's many other esteemed guests so i'm very uh very fortunate to have some time to, to speak with you and speak with the audience and while we're there, actually, a shout out to your podcast. You've got a couple of great podcasts that are always in the, you know, the business top 20 um, podcasts. What are the names of those just for our listeners? Yeah, it's very, they're very simple. They say it on the tin, Chris. They uh, the Australian <laughs> Finance Podcast and the Australian Investors Podcast. Yeah, so we've been flattered with how successful they've been and um, the reception that we've been able to, I guess, snowball into our courses as well has been tremendous. So as yep. you know, you guys said at the top of the show, um, 10,000 students is what we want to get into our free courses. And that's what I'm most proud of. So if you want to Maybe. take a free course, please head on over to our website. Wow. Change your lives. I'm going to do them. <laughs> Thanks very much, Owen. <laughs> Thanks for your time, guys. Thanks, Owen. We want to make you a better elephant rider. And this week's elephant rider training is... Let's pick up on Owen's value checklist and just make a few tweaks to make it apply to property. He said that uh, when you, he's looking at shares, he looks at A, the company must be cash flow positive, uh, B, has a competitive advantage or a moat, and three, that it's something that he understands, a company you understand. 
and I think the cash flow positive thing, we just had quite a lot of chat around that. I think it's important to also think that cash flow positive with property can come in the future at some point. And if you are yep. looking at a long-term strategy and how that property fits in with your long-term strategy, you might be buying that property and not really too worried about its cash flow at any point because A, you can afford it in your own cash flow, but also because you really focus on capital growth and you're buying it with a view to selling in order to pay down other debt in the future. That's one way in which people look Mm. at buying property. And so therefore with property, I think you've really got to focus on what your goals are down the, at the end, uh, your exit strategy or your uh, retirement plan or whatever it is, whatever reason you're buying property, that's why you've got to be thinking long term and the cash flow sort of fits into that, uh, that decision making. The competitive advantage, that's really about scarcity and that's really yeah. around buying an asset in an in a area where it's, uh, you know, it's a good location, a, a quality location. We often talk about the 80-20 rule, the 80% of its location, 20% of it is within that location, you've got to get a good asset. So you're looking at scarcity, whether that means the style of, of property, the size of land, the proximity to, you know, views, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all of those things, you've got to be looking for scarcity. And so that's effectively the competitive advantage. And then thirdly, um, he talks about companies you understand. Well, properties you understand. And and I think that this is where some people get a bit carried away with property and they think, okay, I want to buy commercial now. I've got residential, I want to buy commercial uh, or I want to buy industrial. And, and that's fine for certain investors, but some many people don't understand um, those types of properties. And it, it's a very, very different way of assessing value in commercial industrial property than it is in residential. But I think also a lot of property investors fall in the trap that they feel like they do understand property because we all live in property. And so that idea of understanding the property is very important, understanding the pros and cons, different property in different locations, and the calibre and the qualities that or characteristics that a property in one location might require to do very, very well over time versus in a different location. And understanding that just because I live in a property in a suburb doesn't mean that those same principles that I know and understand actually apply in a different type of property in a different suburb. I mean, I think I agree with all those three points. I think with the cash flow, the most important part is is factoring the future cash flow, your future yield, and um, that's what matters. It's not the negative cash flow today. It's what's that going to be in five years, 10 years, 20 years? Uh, and that comes, a lot of that's driven by the scarcity of the property, which is, you know, the competitive value, um, competitive advantage. And then finally, like you say, in terms of understanding it, just understand that you have got knowledge gaps and you do potentially need to do more research before you go and buy property. You can't just go in blindly. Um, there's lots of elements to what drives the market. So get your knowledge before you go and buy property, not after. In our next episode, we're doing a deep dive into the Canberra property market. We're interviewing buyer's agent Claire Corby because a lot of listeners have been asking us what's been going on down there. We're going to talk about whether our capital city property market is immune from price falls because of all the public servants there, whether there's actually a two-tier property market, and what are some of the stats suggesting that the Canberra property market might be bucking the trend during COVID and whether they're really that reliable. Join us. If you're looking to buy your dream Dream home or an investment property in Sydney's inner west, eastern suburbs or North Shore, my team and I can help you buy without regrets. Reach out via my website, gooddeeds.com.au. If you're looking to buy your first home, thinking of upgrading into a new one or purchasing an investment property anywhere in Australia, my team would love to carefully guide you on this journey and most importantly, get the finance right. Reach out via our website, wealthful.com.au. If you're a first home buyer and you don't want to miss a step with this most important purchase, join me on Wednesday nights at 7.30pm Sydney time on the Home Buyer Academy Facebook page for live Q&A. Check out the website, homebuyeracademy.com.au. Every month, my team hosts a webinar on what we are seeing at the banks, the best rates, changing policy and their service. We also share the latest insights we hear and read that are impacting the property market direction. Check out wealthful.com.au. Thanks for joining us. We'd love to see you again. And remember, don't be a dumbo.